Today we're going to discuss muscles. So here's you in histology examples. The histology examples include the top left, which is cardiac. Cardiac muscle is only found in the myocardium of the heart. It's unique in shape. It also has some striations to it. You're going to find that it's intermediate when it comes to fatigue and contraction. Your skeletal muscle is very quick to contract. It's also very quick to fatigue. Now, the skeletal muscle does have unique characteristics. It has these striations that you see, those lines there, and the dark circles are going to be nuclei. That is another unique characteristic for skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is known as being multinucleated, meaning that it has many nuclei per cell. This breaks the general rule that we have regarding cells. Cells are supposed to have one nucleus per cell, and in the human body, there are two exceptions to that rule. You have skeletal muscle that is multinucleated, meaning it has many, many cell, many, many nuclei per cell. And then you have red blood cells that lack a nucleus. They end up giving up that nucleus. So those are your two exceptions to that rule. Now, skeletal muscle, like I said, is very fast to contract. It's very fast to fatigue though. And you're also going to see that it's voluntary. You have control over it. Whereas the cardiac muscle, you would not have control over that. You're able to control this because the nerves attach to the muscles and then it's just unique in the sense that it can, it can be controlled. Um, you have here the nervous tissue attaching to the skeletal muscle in the bottom left-hand picture. You're going to see that the lines that kind of look like a stem to a flower, those lines there are actually the nerve itself. This is known as your motor nerve axon. An axon is the highway that's going to connect the ends of that nerve cell. Now, the axon here is identified as motor. Motor's telling me that it's dealing with some kind of muscle or gland as opposed to a sensory axon. Sensory would be sending information up to the brain, and here motor is descending the information from the central nervous system to some kind of muscle gland, also known as an effector. It starts with an E, all right? If you see an um, A effector with an A effector, then that's gonna be sensory things, all right? So that's coming to the brain. A sending to the brain is how I like to think of it, whereas effectors are descending the information to a muscle or a gland, and that's going to be motor. This information is going to lead into your final exam uh, topics. All right, so when we get on nervous system. Now, your um, picture that you have here, the circular area on that bottom left is known as your end plate. It's also referred to as your NMJ. NMJ stands for neuromuscular junction. So this is where the neuro ne nervous tissue and the muscular tissue connect together. It's a junction site there. And so that's a really interesting place. Um, you're gonna see in um, more detail in lecture and lab later on, that you'll talk about a synapse and um, different chemicals that can go across this barrier here and what all happens. And so it's really kind of a cool thing. Your next picture to the bottom right is going to be smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is found lining your internal organs. So think about the uterus, all right, the intestines. This is smooth, it's involuntary. You don't have control over it. It's going to be slow to contract and slow to fatigue. And that makes sense. If you thought about a uterus that was very fast to contract, um, man, you know, monthly cycles would be excruciatingly painful, even more so than what some experience already. So slow to contract, slow to fatigue. It's not going to give out on you as quickly as your skeletal muscle. If we went and ran stadiums, the thing that typically is going to give out on you and make you want to quit running the stadiums is your skeletal muscle. We're hoping that your heart, your cardiac, isn't going to give out on you because that just wouldn't be good. And then your smooth muscle will end up still working afterwards too. So that skeletal muscle is fast to contract, fast to fatigue, 
It's voluntary. You have control over it. Smooth and cardiac or involuntary. All right. So let's look at some of these on a model. In lab, you're going to have this muscle man. This muscle man has an anterior side, and he also has a posterior side. And then there are some structures that are a little more lateral or medial, but we'll go through those structures. Those structures are identified on the right-hand side of your screen. Now, these muscles aren't every muscle you have, obviously, all right? These are just a handful of them that you need to know. Now, the ones in bold, we will discuss uh, in more detail, all right? But understanding why a muscle is called what it's called will help you know its function or its shape or location. So it's beneficial to understand that kind of information. So the ones in bold, um, you have several of them that are listed here. And you need to know the origin, insertion, and action for those. All right. So there's a list for you. And origin, think about like where is it coming from? Where is it inserting? And on your own body, make it move. If you can make it move on your own body, it's going to help you remember it through kinesthetic learning. Remember the action of it. All right. Um, now, a couple things to think about real quick. Let's jump down to the bottom of this table. If you look at number 39, 40, 43, you'll see that it says plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. Plantar flexion and dorsiflexion are both uh, movements that are limited to the foot at the ankle. So plantar flexion, I like to think of it as if I were on my tippy toes and I'm trying to reach for something on the top of a shelf, right? you are putting your foot into plantar flexion by standing on your tippy toes. This motion that you have standing on the tippy toes, the way I remember plantar flexion is the tippy toe one, is that if I am replanting my flower bed and I decide that I have 50 plants that I need to plant, the way I do it is I dig 50 holes. All right, I'm gonna dig those holes I go back and I put a plant into each hole. And by the time I do 50 holes and 50 plants in each hole, I, I'm tired. I'm not even gonna lie to you, I'm lazy. So then I'm gonna come back and I have to put dirt over all of them, right? And the easiest way to put dirt over all of them after you've already dug all these holes and everything is just to stand up, take your foot, point it, and rake the dirt over the plants and press down with your toes, right? By pressing down, you're going into plantar flexion. So you're planting the plants using plantar flexion. Dorsiflexion would be the opposite of that. Dorsiflexion is digging your heel into the ground, trying to point your toes up, right? That's dorsiflexion. So plantar flexion, some examples of it would be if you were trying to accelerate in a car and you're pressing the gas pedal down, that's plantar flexion. Ballerinas are plantar flexion. Tippy toeing, plantar flexion. Planting your plants, plantar flexion. Dorsiflexion is going to be pulling the toes back towards the tibia, right? digging that heel down. That's dorsiflexion. So let's look at some of these in a little bit more detail. Let's start off with the face. So one of the things I would tell you to do as you're learning the muscles is to start in one location and work your way to another location. If you go straight off of the answer key, you're going to find that you're going to jump around some. So I would just say, you know, do everything that you see on the face, then go to the back of the head, do everything on the back of the head. Work your way like down the arms, down the thoracic region, anterior, thoracic region, posterior, then do legs anterior, do legs posterior. All right. Um, I'm going to go through it based off of what the answer key has for you. That way we're not jumping around quite as much um, on that answer key. We make sure we cover everything. But when you're studying, I would study whole sections of the body. So here we go. We're going to start off at number one. 
Number one is frontalis. Frontalis covers your frontal bone. So it makes sense that it's named frontalis because it covers the frontal bone. Frontalis is over your forehead. So this one, often in textbooks, if you see the term occipitofrontalis, it's because they've lumped the occipital muscle, so occipitalis, with frontalis, and they're naming it one muscle. All right, so just a heads up there. Make frontalis work on your, on your body. If you make frontalis contract, what happens to you? You're wrinkling up your forehead, all right? You're raising your eyebrows, and you're, then you're, you're frowning, like with your eyebrows. And so one of the common procedures that happens with frontalis is Botox. They'll go in, they'll inject Botox. It's a botulism toxin, right? Botox, um, that's what it's derived from. And so they'll inject that, it'll paralyze the muscle and it'll end up getting rid of those wrinkles in the forehead region. So that's the most common procedure to have done to frontalis. Number two, number two and number six both have this orbicularis part to it. Orbicularis tells me that it forms an orbit. It makes a circle, all right? So orbicularis oculi. Oculi tells me it's ocular, so like an ocular lens to a microscope. It's at the eyepiece, so it's telling me it's around the eye. So oculi tells me eye. The other way I remember this is that it ends with an eye and it's around the eye, all right? So orbicularis oculi is the one that goes around the eye, you see that at number two. Orbicularis oris, all right, so I'm already jumping for you, sorry. Orbicularis oris is at number six. Oris tells me oral, all right, so oral. Oral is gonna tell me that it's around the, the mouth region, so it's the circle around the mouth. So let's look at that diagram that identifies their action. So orbicularis oris is going to be your kissing muscle. It allows you to pucker your lips, right? And orbicularis oculi is going to allow you to close your eye or wink. Now orbicularis oculi does have an origin. Its origin is gonna be that right there, kind of by the tear ducts at the lacrimal bone, and then also at frontal, and then your maxilla, and the insertion is the eyelids. Orbicularis oris has no origin, and the insertion for it is going to be the lips. And it allows you to pucker your lips. So I like to think of this one as my kissing muscle, All right? The legal profession that utilizes this the most would end up being like wind instruments. So that way they can, they can pucker their lips and blow. The next one on your list is number three. Number three is close to the nose, so it's nasalis. So nasalis, here it says nasal. Nasalis is what it's listed as on that other answer key. Coming down to number four, four is going to lift levator, labi superioris. Levator tells me it lifts. Labi or labi tells me lip. And which lip does it lift? it lifts the upper lip, superioris, the top one. So this is my Elvis Presley muscle. If you make it contract, it'll pull the upper lip up. Number five, you have zygomaticus major. Zygomaticus major is your um, major muscle over the zyg zygomatic bone. So zygomaticus major, you can see that zygomatic bone um, superior to it. All right, so just come down, you'll see that one, zygomaticus major. Then we just talked about orbicularis oris, and now we're to number seven. Number seven is depressor anguli oris. Depressor tells me it pulls it down. What does it pull down? It pulls the angle of the mouth. So depressor anguli oris. This is one of your frowning muscles. Number eight. So number eight is sometimes identified as temporalis, but in our Answer key, uh, we're gonna say that it is auricularis superior. Auricularis is one of your vestigial muscles. It's one that some people can control and it'll make them wiggle their ears. 
Not everyone is able to do that. The purpose on other animals for that muscle is that it allows the ears to turn so they can hear. But among humans, what we do is we turn our head to identify the direction of the sound or to listen better. All right. But that's what auricular superior is. You can put your hand over your ears and that would be auricular superior. If you come back behind the ear, you're going to have auricularis posterior there. All right, so that's those two muscles. Going over the anterior. All right, so let's start off at number 11. So 11 tells me sterno, which means sternum, clito, which means clavicle, and mastoid, which is the mastoid process behind the ear. Remember that hump on the temporal bone? So this is a muscle that is a flexor of your neck. It's going to attach the sternum, the clavicle, and the mastoid process. So that's number 11. Number 10, we did skip over, so I didn't show you that posterior one yet. That posterior one is going to be on the back of the head, and you see occipitalis there, covering the occipital bone. And then that auricularis posterior is going to be at number 9. So you can see that one that we talked about a minute ago. Scalene or scalene, um, in some textbooks it has an I, in others it drops the I, it has an E, that's because it's three muscles. You're going to see that towards the front. It's those three up there by the neck. Right, you see that number 12? Just above the clavicle. Levator scapulae. So levator scapulae, levator tells me it lifts. What does it lift? It lifts the scapula. So let's go back to a posterior view. Levator scapulae is going to come down the back of the neck and it's going to attach to the scapula. So it's not identified here, but that's where it would be um, on the back of the neck there. So levator scapulae kind of runs down underneath the trapezius and then attaches. The trapezius muscle is named trapezius because of its shape. So it looks like a trapezoid. You'll see that it comes from the back of the head, goes lateral to the shoulders, and then comes back medial down the back. That's number 14. So that's your trapezius muscle. Infraspinatus tells me it's inferior to the spine. And when you think inferior to the spine, typically people think the medial spine, like the spine to all of those vertebrae, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the spine on the scapula. You know that bridge that attaches the scapula, the bulk of the scapula to the acromial process. That's the scapula um, spine that spinatus is referring to. So it's inferior to that. You'll see it up top um, on this posterior side, just kind of next to trapezius, but right there over the scapula. So that's infraspinatus. Number 16 tells me that it's lateral and it's dorsal. So number 16 is going to be located lateral on the back side. Right? Those are often referred to as like the love handle area. Number 17, gluteus maximus. Gluteus maximus is that larger buttocks muscle. Everybody knows that one. Going to your deltoid, your deltoid forms the curvature of your shoulder. So deltoid injections, like when you get shots in the shoulder, that's where they're, they're hitting. That's going to tie into the humerus, that deltoid tuberosity. Remember that? Deltoid tuberosity is a tender spot. So if you are pressing down your arm, your upper arm and your deltoid, you will come to like a tender spot a few inches below your shoulder. And then that is where the deltoid inserts right there. You can feel that. All right. So that's the deltoid. The deltoid is going to originate at the clavicle and the scapula. And then it inserts onto that humerus. It basically allows you to flap your arm, all right? So that's gonna give you abduction, abduction AB. Ab tells me it pulls the, pulls the body part away versus adduction. Ad tells me it brings it together. 
So abduction is going to allow me to pull the shoulder, all right? And then it's also going to allow that flexion and extension of the shoulder. So that's your deltoid. Number 19, it's telling me that it's an anterior muscle that is serrated. So when you have serrations, serrations end up, you can see it a little bit better here. You see that zigzagging, zigzagging on the side. So number 19, underneath the arm, on the anterior of the thoracic, so it's coming towards the front and there's these zigzags. Okay, so that's, when I think about things that are have serrations, you think about like saws, some knives, right? That's the zigzagging. This one's commonly referred to as your boxer muscle. So your boxer muscle is going to allow shoulder motion, but it has the serrations and then it's coming towards the front of the body. Your pectoralis major, so these are major muscles of your chest. You have another muscle that starts with pec, and that's pectineus. Pectineus is a teeny, teeny muscle in the groin. So pectoralis major are major breast muscles. Pectineus is going to be a smaller groin muscle. So pectoralis major, if you make it move, all right, for some people they can move it, but for the rest of us, what we're going to do is move that shoulder, and you will feel pectoralis major move. You have your external abdominal obliques, right? External, obviously, means external. Um, their abdominal area. If you come in, you're going to have rectus abdominis. Rectus comes from the Latin recti, which tells me that it's straight. Think about things that have rect in it. Like if you erect a statue, you put a statue up. Um, rectum tells me that the tube turns, the, turn, the intestines. They turn and you're gonna to go to the rectum, which makes it, it's another straight area. So rect tells me that something's straight, a rectangle, right? Straight. Rectus abdominis tells me that the muscle straight and they're over the abs, um, the abdominal region. And so they're gonna tie in to your pubic tubercle. You have the sheath of rectus abdominis, which is that covering over on the left-hand side of your screen. You have your triceps brachii and your biceps. This is why you can't call them just tries and buys. Um, your biceps brachii, you actually end up with a biceps femoris. And so you need to make sure you write out the whole thing. You can see your biceps brachii on the picture here. That is your bulkier upper arm muscle. The other one is going to be underneath. And so it's better seen from this posterior view. You see it up top at number 24. Then you have these extensors of the, of the arm. They're going to allow for some hand movement. So you have extensor carpe radialis longus. Extensor carpe radialis longus tells me that it extends the carpals. It's along the radius and it's a longer muscle. So it's there at the forearm. You have extensor digitorum. It extends the digits. You have extensor reticulum, that's going to be the binding of your wrist, but check it out down at the ankle. You're going to have binding of the ankle with the same exact name. This is number 46 on our list. You have extensor pollicis brevis, so extends, extends the thumb, the proximal phalanx, right? So it's your hitchhiker muscle. It allows you to lift your thumb up. Brachioradialis. If you were to do like a hammer, like make a fist and like you're going to hit the desk, brachioradialis is the muscle on top of your forearm when you're in that position. It's the superior muscle that pops up. That's brachioradialis. Right? Um, some people think of it more like a Popeye muscle, although his whole forearms are big, but that's, that's that one, brachioradialis. So it actually connects to your radial styloid process, and that's that muscle there. Then we are to sartorius. Sartorius is the longest skeletal muscle that you have. It's going to connect lateral hip to medial knee. 
Sartorius comes from the Latin sartori, which means tailor. So this one's one that some people have a hard time understanding, and there's a couple ideas behind it. So one is that if you were to make like a muscle man doll, you would have to make sartorius. It just looks like a piece of thread, that it is a piece of thread that would be woven at the hip and then at the medial knee. Sartorius um, also maybe because of the way tailors would sit. So a tailor is somebody that hems your clothes, right? Um, or makes clothes. And so the idea is that back in the day, tailors would sit cross-legged or crisscross applesauce or Indian style, however you want to term that. Nowadays, they typically say crisscross applesauce. Um, but anyway, if you're sitting in that position, you are stretching sartorius. And if you're like, really? If you go into that extreme yoga kind of position where you put one foot on the opposite thigh, you can feel sartorius, the insertion and the origination site for it. You can feel it pull. So if you sit on the floor and you place one foot on the opposite thigh doing a crisscross position, you can feel that. And so you're stretching out sartorius. And so that's what sartorius comes from. We then have your quadriceps. Quad tells me there's four, but there's only three listed here. So you have rectus femoris, vastus medialis, and vastus lateralis. The reason you're missing that fourth one is because you'd have to take rectus femoris and remove it to see vastus intermedialis. So let's look at these. Rectus femoris tells me it's straight and it's over the femur. All right, this is the one that we've talked about before when we did the knee joint. Rectus femoris comes towards the patella, it turns into the quadricep tendon, inserts onto the patella, turns into the patellar ligament, inserts onto the tibial tuberosity. All right, that's what we have going on on the front there. Anatomical positioning from there, you have two vastus muscles. The vastus muscle that is medial, closer to the, the mid area, the inside of the thigh, that teardrop muscle there is vastus medialis. The one on the outside of the body is going to be vastus lateralis. All right, so you have those. Coming up to the groin, you have that teeny, teeny muscle in the groin. That's pectineus. You have gracilis, which is going to be a longer one medial. Then you end up with adductor. Remember, it's pulling the legs together. Adductor longus. All right, that's right next to it. Then we're gonna to go to the back of the leg. The back of the leg has the hamstrings. Your hamstrings are gonna be made up of 36 biceps femoris. The next one over is semitendinosus. And then even more medial than that, you're not gonna see it on this image, it's not identified there, but the most medial one is membranous. So semimembranous is the medial one of the hamstrings. Come down the back of the leg, your calf muscle is gastrocnemius. Next to it, you have soleus. Coming down from gastrocnemius, you're gonna to attach to the heel. That heel bone is your calcaneal bone or calcaneus. And so it's muscle to bone and that's a tendon. So calcaneal tendon, commonly referred to as your Achilles. You have the flexors and the, the um, extenders of the foot. So you have extensor digitorum longus. So it extends the digits. It's a longer muscle. Coming towards the front now, you have tibialis anterior. It's over the tibia. It's in the front. Number 44. 44 is at the bottom of the foot. It's the first triangle on his right foot that is on the left side of that foot, right? That triangle right there is going to end up being abductor digiti minimi. And then over the fibula, remember fibula is lateral, that's that thinner bone. If you come straight up that right foot of his, we will be at number 45, fibularis longus. So it's a longer muscle over the fibula. And then we already talked about the binding of the ankle at number 46, because it's the same name as the binding of the wrist. Now there are some bones that you have to know. 
And I have those listed here. Things to think about, though, is that some of these are structures on the bones. Um, so if I were to say, hey, what is the bone at letter G? And you said it's medial malleus. Well, that's the structure, right? Which bone is it? You should be thinking that it's the tibia. All right. Well, that's what we have for muscle. So there's definitely more muscles that you need to know, um, especially for lecture. But for lab, this is the, the bulk of them. Remember that origin, insertion, action, make it move on your own body.